Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to TFW Church Online. Welcome to our Good Friday morning service. Um, we're going to have a special time together today. Really glad you could tune in and spend this time with us. We're going to sing some songs of worship today. Uh, we're going to have a message. We're going to break bread together later as well. So uh, let me encourage you to lean in and, and really uh, make the most of this opportunity this morning. Um, feel free to join in with these songs today as well. I'm going to start by singing this, The Power of the Cross. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame. Stand for 
Hey guys, just a few announcements before we uh, carry on with the rest of our service. Uh, firstly, we just want to say thank you so much for those who put in uh, all the work behind the scenes, caring for each other, ringing people. Uh, we just couldn't do it without you and we're so thankful for that. Uh, just uh, a few more things. Firstly, Church Suite, we said, you know, most of you know what it is. It's our database where everything happens. Uh, Remember to keep looking on it, check on, on it, log in, uh, all our details are on there, events, uh, links to online, all of that sort of thing. Uh, it'd be really great if you could upload a picture on it so then we could um, match your face with a picture, especially at a time as this. Um, and that would be really helpful. And also, you know, we're a church that believes in praying. We believe prayer changes everything. Uh, it's just really important to keep praying in this season. Uh, keep praying uh, for our country, for our community. Uh, for our closer family and friends. And uh, that's what we're going to do right now. So whatever you're doing, if you just want to bow your head with me, uh, and we're just going to enter into uh, prayer with God. Father, we just thank you that right now, right here, wherever we are uh, watching this from, you are here with us. We thank you, Father, that this time of year is all about you. And that 2,000 years ago, you gave yourself for us, Father, that we could enter into relationship with you with you and we thank you Father that you sent your son Jesus and we do just pray right now for our country Father we pray that um, you would just eradicate this virus Father we pray for um, wholeness we pray for healing Father we pray for uh, restored relationships uh, in communities uh, we particularly pray Father right now for our frontline workers those in the NHS those working in uh, supermarkets, Father, those working in the care system, uh, and all the other roles, Father. We just pray right now for protection over them. We pray that you would keep them from getting the virus, Father. You keep them whole and protected, and their families as well. And we do pray, Father, that, yeah, that we would just stay safe in this time, and that we can look to you. And we thank you, Father, that you're good, and that you work things uh, for your good in, in this situation. And we just pray right now that we'd have an open heart uh, to get from it what you want us to for the rest of this service. We thank you, Father, and we love you. Amen. The reading today is taken from Psalm 22, verses 1 to 19. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, in you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, or trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, 
Come quickly to my aid. Well, friends, it's uh, Good Friday, and it's the, the day in the Christian calendar where all over the world Christians will be thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Um, that's something that we do uh, regularly as Christians. We stop and whenever we take communion together as a church family, uh, we, we, we sort of stop the, the sort of ce celebration of his resurrection. We pause that for a, a moment or two and we enter again into the suffering of Christ, uh, of his incredible sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. But every year at Easter, we have the opportunity to do that um, on a particular day, on Good Friday. We have the chance to stop and pause and really enter into uh, the suffering uh, of Christ and uh, the passion of Christ, what he did on our behalf at the cross at Calvary. And that's what we're going to do uh, together today. I want to really encourage you right now in this moment to lay aside every other distraction Part of doing church virtually is that we can so easily get distracted by you know, Facebook and emails and, or even conversations in the room. But I, I really want to encourage you um, to just tune in, lean in in your heart to, to the Lord and to what he's done uh, on our behalf. And in these next few moments, I want, to, I want to share a few thoughts out of the scriptures. And then in a little, little bit, we're going to take communion together. And um, let this be a really um, meaningful moment for you. This is probably the strangest Easter that any one of us has, has ever had, I expect. We're so used to going to, to church and being together. But you know, uh, I heard somebody say this, this this past week, that even though the church building is closed, that doesn't mean the church is closed. The church is still alive and well. And there's much for us to celebrate there's much for us to do there's a great difference for us to make in the world and today there's a moment for us to remember together and one of the great things about this online church experience is that at least we have the knowledge that we are tuning in together and so let's really make this as special a, a day as we can um, in the beginning the Bible tells us in the beginning that God created the heavens and the earth, and then he made man. And one of the things God said about man was that it is not good for him to dwell alone. It's just not good for him to be on his own. He needs, he needs companionship. And so he made, he made Adam and he made Eve as a companion. And from that moment on, that was the first family. And, and from that moment on, man has always you know, been in families, men and women. We've, we've needed each other. Uh, isolation is a punishment. Uh, it's a tactic that's used to try and uh, break people, to try and control people, is to isolate them. And so it's interesting, isn't it, that we're now in this season of lockdown and sort of enforced isolation. And we're doing that for a, a good reason. And, uh, you know, we, we should be doing that. We need to be helping uh, the government, we need to be helping uh, the, the National Health Service by, by doing uh, this kind of isolation to stop the spread of, of, of COVID-19. But it really does expose that feeling of being uh, cut off from other people. As, as people, we were designed, we were created to be in relationship. In fact, Christianity as we say, we say it all the time at TFW, Christianity is not a solo endeavor. It's a, it's, a, it's a community thing. Christianity is about community. It's about us. It's about we. And it's about us growing together, learning together, supporting each other, and corporately worshiping our God. And so it's a very strange time to be separated from one another. But Maybe this Good Friday, we could think a little bit more about separation and isolation. Because what I want to share today, and hopefully what we're going to see today, is that Jesus Christ was separated on our behalf. 
Jesus Christ was isolated on our behalf. In fact, who is the most isolated person that ever lived? I think we're going to see today that at the moment that Jesus suffers and dies on the cross for us, he becomes the most isolated person of all time. And we'll unpack that a little bit uh, today. But, you know, God is a relational God. When, in fact, in the beginning, when God created Adam and then Eve, the way that the scriptures are written are, are relational. It says, God said, let us make man in our image. The Godhead, the, this, the doctrine of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they've always existed together in relationship. And in that relationship, they said, let us make man in our image. It's not good for man to be alone. Let's make man a helper. Relationship runs right throughout the, the narrative of the scriptures. From, from Genesis right through to Revelation, it's all about relationships, about our relationship with God. And it's about our relationship with, with one another. Um, Jesus, when he came to earth, came to uh, save us, came to rescue us, he, he left the relationship of the Godhead and he entered into a, a human family relationship. We, we talk about that at Christmas, don't we? With Mary and Joseph on their way to Bethlehem and all of those things. But that's what Jesus does. Jesus takes on the most humble position. He's born as a, a, a fragile, delicate, totally dependent baby who needs his mother and his father to love him, nurture him, and raise him. How humble that the God of the universe would do that for us. And so Jesus grows uh, as a young child into a young man, into adulthood, in a family. He's always had relationship. And then you know that when Jesus started his earthly ministry, he uh, immediately called disciples. He, he got a, a team together. Uh, his, it was his group. It was his gang. It was you know, his posse. And for three years, those, those, Jesus and those disciples did life together. The disciples of Jesus traveled with him, ate with him, um, slept in the same area as him. I mean, they were together seven days a week, 24 hours a day, doing life together. And Jesus was all about relationship. And it wasn't just the 12 disciples that were following him. There, were, there was a wider group of disciples that were following him too. And there were crowds that were crowding around him. People wanted to know, people asking him questions. People seeking him for answers and breakthroughs and miracles. Jesus' life was all about people. And it was all about relationship. In fact, when Jesus addresses uh, his disciples uh, in John chapter 15, he makes it very clear to them that they are not servants. He makes it clear that they are his friends. He says this in John chapter 15, verse 15. He says, I no longer call you servants. Because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. There's a real insight there into how Jesus feels about his disciples. He doesn't, he's not lording it over them. He sees them as his deep friends. And within the 12 disciples, we have the three Peter, James, and John. They, they seem to have an even closer relationship with Jesus, that, that particular trio of disciples. And you know, Jesus' life, right through to this particular moment uh, that we're going to talk about today, was, it was all relationship, friendship, love, care. And then you get to, to Matthew and Matthew chapter 26. And in, up until that point, Jesus has been with people. But from Matthew chapter 26 onwards, 
we're going to see that Jesus gradually, bit by bit, loses his relationships with others. Those close relationships start to fall away and Jesus becomes increasingly isolated. If you're in a season of isolation right now, particularly if you are literally, you live on your own, I want to encourage you today that Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be really isolated, really cut off. In, in, in Matthew chapter uh, 26, it starts with this beautiful anointing that happens at a place called Bethany, where a woman comes up to him with a, an alabaster flask, which is full of expensive ointment, and she pours it on his head as he's reclining at a table. And, and, and the other disciples see this and they say, this is just a terrible waste of expensive perfume. But Jesus says this in, in verse 10, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. That woman took something really valuable, really expensive, and poured it out on Jesus as an act of worship. In fact, he goes on to say, for you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Jesus knew what was coming. When Jesus was arrested and um, put through a mock trial, an unjust trial, and then beaten and scourged and then crucified, none of that took him by surprise. In fact, we're told in the scriptures that he willingly went through all of that. He willingly endured it for us. Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own free will. He says, this woman has, has prepared me for burial. And he says, truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. You know, that's really the last beautiful thing that was done to Jesus or for Jesus. From then on, everything is going to be painful. The next thing he does is he, he has uh, Passover. He celebrates Passover, the supper with his, with his disciples. And that's where we, we, um, that's where we get the uh, communion service from uh, because of Passover. And even, even as he celebrates Passover with his uh, disciples, he predicts that Judas is going to betray him. Judas has, has already bargained 30 pieces of silver for, to betray Jesus, to turn him in. And Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And then Jesus talks to Peter. And he says, Peter, listen, you're, you're going to deny me. Peter says, deny you? I'm, I'm not going to deny you, Jesus. I would die with you. Jesus says, no, no. He says, he says before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times, not just once, three times. It's interesting that uh, Judas is betraying him. Peter is going to deny him. And then Jesus goes to Gethsemane. And it's, it's, it's that night time before he's going to be crucified the next day. And, and in Gethsemane, Jesus is troubled and he's sorrowful. He knows he's facing the agony of the cross. And you know, when we're troubled and when we're sorrowful, what we really need is other people. We all know this. When we're sick, when we're anxious, when we're afraid, it's so comforting to have other people around us. And, and just let me say, if you're going through something, make sure that you don't isolate yourself from the relationships of other people. I know you might not physically be able to be with people right now, but you should pick up the phone. You should call somebody, talk to them, FaceTime somebody. Make sure that you're connected to others because we all know how other people can lift us. And so Jesus goes into Gethsemane and he says to the, 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 the group of disciples, you stay here, and then he takes his three. Peter, James, and John, his best friends. He takes them and says, come, come with me. We're going to go a bit further, and, and, and I want you to do something. I want you to watch and pray with me. 
He's asking his friends to help him pray through this pain and agony that he's feeling. That word watch, watch and pray, just means stay awake. That's all it means. Stay awake with me. Pray with me. Jesus goes a little further, falls on his face, and he starts to surrender his will to the will of the Father. He says, God, you know, it's, it's, Father, it's not my will, but your will be done. If there's any other way to get this job done of redemption, if there's any other way that we could avoid the cross, let this cup pass from me, he says, but nevertheless, not what I want, what you want, Father. He's in agony. The Bible says he's sweating drops of blood. And he comes back to his, his three, his best mates, his best friends in the world. And they're asleep. The ones that he's asked to stay awake and pray with him at the most troubling time for him. The Bible says their eyes were heavy and they fell asleep. He wakes them up. He says, come on, pray with me. Watch with me. He goes and prays again, crying out to his father. And when he comes back, they're sleeping again. Three times Jesus goes through this. And finally, he comes back to his friends, wakes them up. He says, hey, the hour's come and I'm going to be betrayed. I wonder what it was like for Jesus to see these close human earthly relationships slowly falling away. Judas comes and betrays him. And he betrays him in the most uh, hypocritical way. He betrays him with a kiss. Of all the ways that he could have betrayed Jesus, he chooses the intimacy of a kiss. A kiss of friendship, a kiss of honor, a kiss of love. He uses that as the sign to betray Jesus. How ironic. Peter starts trying to fight. Jesus says, put away your sword. The crowd arrest Jesus and the Bible says all the disciples ran away. I'm not saying any of this, by the way, to criticize the disciples because I think the disciples are just like us, just like you and me. Sometimes we have great dreams of how we're going to serve Jesus and great plans and, oh, don't you worry, Jesus, I'll never deny you. But sometimes we can. Don't worry, Jesus, I'll always obey you. But sometimes we disobey. Don't worry, Jesus, I'll never have doubts. I'll always, I'll always have faith. And yet sometimes we struggle with doubts. Maybe you and I would be the very ones who would run away in the face of danger. Maybe you and I, just like Peter, would be the very ones who would even deny that we knew Jesus if we were in that same position. Jesus is taken and uh, he goes through this mockery of a trial with Pilate. And, and then in Matthew chapter 27, we start to read about the isolation that Jesus is in. And everything Jesus goes through, he goes through alone. Matthew 27 verse, 20, verse 27 says that the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. And they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. You know, when I read those words, the thing that strikes me the most is they are doing this to the God of the universe. The holy Lord God Almighty, creator of all things, who's come to be with us, who's come to suffer for us. These, these soldiers are mocking him, beating him and spitting on him. And Jesus doesn't have any of his mates there to back him up. 
There's no other person there who could, could help him, encourage him, stand with him. He's facing all of this alone. And then he goes on to say, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And they sat down and kept watch over him there, and over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Here's Jesus dying on the cross. And in that moment, as he dies on the cross, he's taking all of the pain and all of the guilt and all of the mess and all of the sin of our lives. He's dying in our place. He's paying the price for our redemption. He's absorbing into himself our anger and our hatred, and our disobedience, and our lusts, and our betrayals. And he's offering us his love and his forgiveness. In verse 45, he goes on to say this, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, as Jesus bears the full weight and horror of our sin, and he is separated from us, but he is not only separated from every other human. In that moment, he is separated from his heavenly father. He becomes the most isolated man who ever lived. Because not only is he separated from his father and from us, but he is carrying the full weight of our sin. Some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. One of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. We know actually from elsewhere in the scriptures what Jesus cried. He cried out, it is finished. The work's done. The price is paid. The debt's cancelled. And he yielded up his spirit. It's finished. Psalm 22, which was our reading today, uh, includes that phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those that were standing around that day, when they heard Jesus say those words, those that especially knew the Old Testament, that knew the Psalms, they would have known what that was a reference to. It was a prophetic moment, Jesus saying, look, I am the Lamb of God. But Psalm 22 talks about the fact that God will deliver me. He will rescue me. You know, Here's the truth. Even though in that moment Jesus 
felt the full separation from his heavenly father. The truth is that God the Father was still faithful to Jesus because Jesus trusted that God the Father would raise him again from the dead. And that's what we'll celebrate in a couple of days on Sunday morning. There will be cause for great celebration because this is not the end of the story. Jesus rises from the dead. He conquers sin and death and hell for us. And there's going to be plenty of time on Sunday to celebrate that. But for today, we're thinking about the price that was paid. We're thinking about the sacrifice. So how should we respond to this um, today? How do we respond to what Christ has done for us? Well, uh, I've just got a few ideas. Firstly, we should enter into his suffering. We should really think about what Christ has done for us and, and not take it for granted. You know, sometimes the, the, the gospel story uh, the, the crucifixion story even can become so familiar to us that we, we sort of take it for granted, we know it. And we can know it to a point where it loses its power. And I want to encourage you this Easter to really let it in in a fresh way, the, the, the incredible sacrifice that Christ made. Not only should we enter into his suffering, but number two, that should produce in us a, an incredible sense of gratitude a real deep heartfelt gratitude where we say thank you thank you Jesus for what you have done for me would you say thank you to him today maybe you would take a moment in in a moment when we take communion together and you would just pause and say thank you Jesus I'm so grateful that you did it and you didn't just do it for the world you did it for me personally and then thirdly, that gratitude should fuel in us. It should lead us to a place of real surrender, where we surrender our lives fully back to the Lord. You know, in 1896, that, uh, that hymn was published, I Surrender All. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. And... Um, that is the response. It's the only appropriate response when you really think about what Christ did for us. Jesus, you died for me. I'll live for you. I'll live for you. I surrender all to you. Listen, I don't know what the rest of this month holds. I don't know what the rest of this year holds, and neither do you. But what I do know is this. If we would live surrendered lives to Jesus, he will lead us and guide us through the rest of this month, through the rest of this year. He's promised to always be there, never leave us, never forsake us. And so today, maybe it's a time where you could, in a fresh way, surrender your life, surrender your heart, surrender your fears, surrender your hopes and dreams, surrender the future back to the Lord and say, Jesus, your will be done. Jesus in Gethsemane surrendered to the Father and said, Father, your will be done. Now is the time for us to surrender to the Lord and do the same thing. Say, Lord, your will be done in my life. So let's pray. Jesus, we're so grateful for what you did for us on the cross, that you became so isolated on our behalf. You were completely cut off from other people and you were cut off from your heavenly Father for us so that we might never be alone, so that we might never be that isolated. Thank you because of the, the, the debt that you paid for us because of your grace, because of your forgiveness, we can always know the assurance that we are loved and accepted by our Heavenly Father, that we will never be alone again. Jesus, we want to say thank you so much to you today. 
right now as a church family, we say thank you. And would you help us to deeply and fully surrender our hearts and lives back to you in this moment as we prepare to take communion together. Amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree Today we can do what Christians have done for 2,000 years and what Christians all over the world today will be doing. They'll be entering into what Jesus did at the Passover where he instituted uh, the Lord's Supper, the communion and the sacrament. And so uh, 
hopefully where you are uh, now, you have some, some bread or a cracker or something, uh, some wine or some juice. And we're just going to take a moment and take uh, communion together as a church family. It's a beautiful thing to be able to do. It's so simple, isn't it? We take, we take the bread and we remember that Jesus' body was broken for us. And then we, we take the cup and we remember that Jesus' blood was shed for us. And Jesus said, whenever we do this, we proclaim his death until he comes. We do it in remembrance of him, proclaiming his death till he comes again. One day, Jesus will come again. He will. We don't know when, but he will come again and he will put things right in our world. There will be an end to all of the suffering. There will be an end to sickness and disease and sin and war. Heaven and earth will be renewed. We will live in the new creation. We will enjoy the resurrection together. But until then, we proclaim his death until he comes. And so I just want to encourage you to take the elements now. Take your bread. And just remember. Remember that this is the body of Jesus. Broken for us. And then we take the cup and we remember with gratitude in our hearts, this is the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us. Let's pray again. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your broken body and your shed blood. Thank you that you know every one of us tuning into this online service today. You know all about our sins. You know all about our fears. You know about our disobedience. You know the ways that we've failed you. But we praise you and thank you that because of what you've done for us, there is forgiveness for all of our sin. There's the promise of resurrection from the dead and eternal life for all those who trust you. And there's the promise that in this life, you will never leave us alone. You'll never forsake us. You are always with us. And so Lord, today, we know this has been a real different Good Friday, but help us to think throughout this day, just to ponder again what you've done for us. Lead us through these next couple of days together towards the celebration of Sunday morning, your resurrection. We love you, Lord. We really do. Amen. Well, thanks, friends, for tuning in today. Thanks for joining us. I hope you have a, a really good rest of the day uh, today and, uh, and a good day tomorrow. And then remember, Sunday morning, we'll be meeting together again here online, online church, and we'll be celebrating the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. Please do join us, 10.30, Sunday morning. We'll see you then.